Our second speaker today is, is David Shearer, and David is the, uh, the current Chief Executive Officer of IAC Squared, so we're very pleased to have him as our guest speaker this morning. So Mr. Shearer has more than 30 years of business experience, including chief, being the Chief Operating Officer for IAC Squared, Associate Chief Information Officer for International Technology Services at the U U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was the Deputy Chief um, Information Officer at the U.S. Department of the Interior and the Executive for Architecture, Engineering, and Technical Services at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Mr. Shearer has been responsible for managing and providing services via international IT infrastructures and has implemented large-scale SAP enterprise resource planning projects. Mr. Shearer has led large geographically separated staff that support global solutions. He holds a BS from Park College, a master's from Syracuse University, management and technical certificates from U.S. National Defense University, and he is a U.S. Federal Executive Presidential Rank Award recipient. So it's our pleasure to welcome Mr. Shearer our stage. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Bob and Joe, I appreciate your opening comments. Um, let me see here. Um, so before I get into this, uh, you know, I speak around the world. I think last year I averaged about eight hours a week in an aircraft uh, flying around the, the world talking about cybersecurity. Um, and so I talk on a lot of different topics. Um, and one of the things we, we try to do is it's not just about certification at IC squared. It's, it's looking at blind spots in the industry, whether it's GDPR, whether it's cyber insurance, uh, whether it's, you know, workforce development, uh, all those emerging things we, we talk about and, and try to raise awareness of. So I, I liken it to um, if you've ever seen an accident that happens in the kitchen, a glass that falls off the countertop or a car accident that's starting to occur, Sometimes it's like you can see those things happening in slow motion. It's almost like you can anticipate that it's going to come, but you fe feel somewhat powerless to do anything about it. And uh, so there are a lot of blind spots in our industry when we talk about cyber information software and infrastructure security. And I do separate those four things out because I've been around long enough and came up through the DOD ranks that, you know, uh, we started with information assurance, information security, and cyber seems to be the, the, the key phrase that's caught on. Uh, but information, not just digitized, is also something we take very uh, specific and, and, and responsibility for protecting in all forms or fashions, whether it's connected to an internet, whether it's in a file folder, in a healthcare or a doctor's office. We're all about at IC Squared about protecting information, uh, and that's really abstracted from the technology. So uh, this missing component in the product life cycle, I'll, I'll come back to that, and I'll, make, uh, I'll, tr I'll take you on this little journey this morning to my call to action. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll look at a couple things here. I just want to make you aware. Uh, I, I know that uh, everybody doesn't know who ISC squared is. And what does that in parents, uh, you know, we can get into a mathematical discussion that it's not a true function. And, you know, this, this was started back in 1989, well before my time. But it stands for the International Information Systems Security Certification Consortium, ISC squared for short. And so we've been around since 1989. Uh, we've grown to uh, 115,000 members in over 160 countries, many of which uh, for, you're probably representing. Uh, and uh, our, our call to action, let me see here. Oh, I'll get it, folks. So our mission is really to provide uh, members and constituents with credentials, resources, and thought leadership. Um, today, I won't be talking about credentials and so forth. There'll be more on the thought leadership relative to products. and. But we focus on cyber information software and infrastructure security. Um, but more importantly, our vision is to inspire a safe and secure cyber world. So uh, when we talk about BHAG's big, hairy, audacious goals, uh, trying to inspire a safe and secure cyber world is one of those big, hairy, audacious uh, goals. And uh, so, so we take that seriously, and um, we, uh, we're working toward that end. Now, there are two components of IC squared. There's a C6. These are IRS terms here in the United States, so I don't expect uh, those from outside the U.S. to understand this. But the C6 is our association, so that's our members. And our C3 is where we do our philanthropic work. Uh, it used to be called the IC squared Foundation. It's now called the Center for Cyber Safety and Education. Uh, and this is where we look at three components, research, scholarships for cybersecurity professionals, 
and safe and secure online where we try to protect children, seniors, and, and everyone in between. Um, so on your table, uh, just a, a quick little plug here, there are some trifolds around here. Garfield is now our international, where we have sole rights uh, internationally for Garfield to be our spokes cat for our safe and secure online program, and that's where we raise awareness and train children to be safe and secure online. Um, Garfield has great international reach. Uh, there's a new Garfield movie coming out, and, and Garfield's a character that kind of resonates with children around the world, and it's all about protecting children. There are 1.9 billion kids around the world uh, that we're looking to raise awareness and teach and educate to be safe and secure online. We launched our seniors program last summer. My dad is 94 years old. He clicks on anything that comes in. It doesn't matter how many times I say, Dad, that's a phishing attempt. He says, don't try to parent your father. I'm your father. So these are the things that, 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 we, uh, that we deal with. So uh, seniors are vulnerable, just like children. I mean, you know, the telemarketing calls that used to come in are much more sophisticated now that they come in email. And uh, so we need to raise awareness and protect our, our seniors. So we've gone after two vulnerable groups, our young, our seniors, and the next step will be to, to educate the average consumer of how they can be safer and more secure online. Um, so that's kind of the background of IC squared. So I'll get into my, I'll, I'll take you along, I'm not trying to sell you uh, any software or anything, just raise a little bit of awareness of who we are and we're easy to find. And if we can help in any way, reach out, ask us any questions. So the threat landscape as, as, as Bob and Joe were, were pointing out is constantly changing. You know, we talk about the attack surface. I mean, if you look at the attack surface in this room, probably in your bags there, everybody has one or two mobile devices. They're connect through, connected through an LT uh, network. You might be on the Wi-Fi here. Uh, you know, technology is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, and, and when you see developing uh, economies, some have just taken a complete leap, leapfrog. They, they never pulled copper or fiber. They went completely wireless right out the gate. So within the cybersecurity profession, uh, the threat landscape is changing, and uh, we need to be aware of this. So I know Joe uh, pointed this out earlier. Uh, through our foundation, our Center for Cyber Safety and Education, we do a, a every two years, we do a global information security workforce study. Um, so a lot of people uh, pull statistics from that. But the reason I point this out here is, is that uh, if you look at it over the years, in, in 2015, 13,930 people responded to this. So it's a very, I mean, when you look at, uh, you know, people that are participating in the survey, I suspect that we just launched it for next year, it's, it's out now, I suspect our next round will be closer to 20,000 people that will respond to the survey. Now, another interesting thing there is, you know, 2,700 uh, uh, people were non-members. And so the nice thing with those statistics is, and I can tell you, Members of IC Squared don't follow any party line. Even if I ask them to go down some party line, they think for themselves. But if you ever thought that maybe the, the data was skewed, now you have a non-member view of people in industry. And I'll give you an example. For years, we've pointed out that women are underrepresented in the cybersecurity workforce, okay? Uh, and we have not been able to turn that needle. Even though we're doing scholarships for women, trying to do what we can, uh, they remain underrepresented. In the survey, and this is free available to you, you can find it on our website. We don't collect any information. We don't come after you to sell anything. This is our, our social responsibility, our give back. So you can, you can download this report and, and uh, read it and learn from it. And some people even set their, their salary rates based on what the, what the survey instrument yields. But so 10% is the average global representation of women in the workforce. The survey said that between our members, it was roughly 11%, uh, or it was 10%. With the non-members, it was 12 So there was a two percentage point variation between our members and, uh, and, and non-members. So you get to see those two things side by side to see what type of variation you have from our members versus uh, non-members. I think that's helpful for people to, to, have, uh, to give it credibility. Now. Um, some of these were pointed out earlier. I don't think this was the exact same statistic, but these are when we look at cyber, this is what came out of it, application vulnerability. So for years, ISC squared, uh, and this will be a kind of a segue into my call to action, um, we've advocated for secure software. And what we mean by that is that, you know, when things are, are bottom line driven and time to market is paramount to industry, security sometimes is a secondary thought. And, uh, and so for years, we've been strong advocates that because we look at our workforce and when a, a leading vendor puts into general release something that's an alpha version of the software and expects our members and society to be their beta testers, sometimes their alpha testers, 
at huge risk exposure of introducing that into what we believe to be a safe environment and reintroducing old vulnerabilities. We think that that is, is, is just a really bad, bad thing. And as consumers, we should be expecting more of, of industry in delivering secure software. But nevertheless, these statistics kind of show you what came out of that survey as far as, and, and we have baselines so we can watch the ebb and flow of where things kind of rise to the top and what's happening within the industry. It allows us to look at the training. From our standpoint, it allows us to look at training and where we need to continue to develop our workforce. Industry looks at it maybe for tools, opportunities to generate uh, solutions and so forth. So, so it's a win-win really for, for all parties. So let's look at the software life cycle. And, and um, we're, we're not gonna get into agile or unified process. I'm just saying just in general terms, the point I'm trying to make here is not uh, what is the best life cycle because that, that'll be a, uh, probably a lifelong debate that uh, continues to rage on, right? Uh, but I, I, I do, uh, I am encouraged that, uh, that Bob's leading agile development. That's a direction we're going as a company as well. And I think it yields uh, much better deliverables uh, than grand design, grand delivery. You know, when I, when I was in the Coast Guard, I was in the Coast Guard for 14 years, I worked with the Coast Guard for 14 years, and, uh, you know, we delivered cutters, we delivered embedded systems that we'll talk about a little bit here later. So security training, look at it at the top there. You know, how often do people in software development get security training? I can tell you, traveling the world, not very often. Uh, it's really more about let's get something to market, let's generate some revenue, and let's keep this train going. Uh, and then once it gets into uh, general release and we deploy it in our infrastructures, we find out what those vulnerabilities are. So longtime advocates, we have a certification on secure software development. We actually have hands-on in, in how to write secure PHP, .NET, Java, those types of things. So we've long time been advocating for that. But the world has changed and ISC Squared can't just continue to talk about software because now we see it virtually every engineering discipline. And this, this is where I'm going with my conversation today. So we look at the engineering process, we identify the problem, search and brainstorm, and we build, okay, where in there when we start to bring these broad disciplines of engineering together is the discussion of security. It's not there. This is that slow train wreck. It's that slow accident that we as a society, a global digital society, we see the accident coming. We feel powerless to do anything about it and we cannot take that position. We are not powerless to do something about it. In fact, people in this very room here today can advocate at your colleges and universities within your forums that we need to do better and I'll, I'll explain. So we have a product life cycle, okay? So there's a market need. Sometimes that market need drives everything. There's a market need, I can make money. So let's get something to market. So we go into product design, and if you, if, you, if you look at engineering, the way products are developed in operations and productions management, it's not unlike how we do software development, right? People go off and people are doing their vertical integrations. We come together to do string testing, then we come together to do integration testing, then we come together to do user acceptance testing. Well, if you wanna know when you have a, a, a project that's off the rails, when requirements are coming in at user acceptance testing, that might be, a, it's, that might be a, a lagging indicator that something's really hosed up, especially if there's security requirements coming in at integration testing. So product life cycle is not much different. It's just that when engineers come together to put a product out that we consume, whether it's early responders, sometimes the military is a little bit different because they have a higher bar, but you know, consumable products, uh, public transportation, those types of things, when they come together to do integration testing, no one's saying, mechanical engineer, did you meet this security requirement? Did you build security electrical? And so we'll get into some examples of things we've seen recently. Here we go, the Jeep. Now, we've all heard about this, right? They were able to take over control of this vehicle from miles and miles away. Now, it was just one vehicle. What if it would have been thousands of vehicles in rush hour traffic in Washington, D.C.? or you know, Los Angeles. Completely plausible, completely plausible. This is a consumer product, and what are we seeing now with cars? Third-party firewalls. Okay, what does that tell us? When you have to do a bolt-on third-party firewall to protect cars, why wasn't that designed in from the inception? Why wasn't that baked into the product from the very beginning? And we have, you know, refrigerators, are doing, you know, denial of service attacks and broadcast storms requesting, I mean, it, 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 
this is this train wreck. This is a slow accident that we're seeing happen in all of these technologies. I have neighbors, they go, you know, I just, I love to open up my garage door with my iPhone. I said, well, that's fantastic. I said, other people can probably do it too. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, or I love these wireless IP uh, cameras that I have throughout my house. I said, well, hopefully you don't have those in, in, in area, you know, well, I have it in the living room so I can make sure the dog's not getting on the sofa. Okay, is there any intimacy that ever happens in your living room? Because chances are, if it's a wireless IP device, if you can access it, other people can, you know. And, and so these are things that we're consuming these products with no rhyme or reason of the security implications because they are cool, because they are convenient. They make our life more convenient, but they make our life far more exploitable. It's just a fact, folks. I hate to be the bearer of this news. And it doesn't mean let's throw our technology away. Let's expect industry to build better security in from inception so that when we consume these products, we can have a higher degree of confidence that there's some semblance. I mean, just some semblance. I'm saying there's virtually, in many degrees, no semblance of security baked into the design of the products that we're consuming at all. Look at the whole life cycle. You can trace it back. No discussion of security. So the Internet of Things, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you, you lose your hair and you get grayer and you've been around long enough and, you know, I'm around long enough to remember when the mainframes were there and the somewhat friendly people would come and you'd run your jobs and then, then it went to decentralized computing and now it's come back and we call things this and we have the cloud and I said, oh, here we go, we're going into meteorology and in, 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 uh, in information technology. Uh, but, you know, back in the telecoms days in the military, you had a cloud up there, and that was a public switch network, and that's where magic happened. You didn't care how packets were routed. It just happened in the cloud. Now we push the data center up there. We push virtualization up there, and this concept of a cloud means all kinds of cool things. Okay, so it's a cloud. All right, I can get that. We'll call it cloud because that resonates with people. It's kind of cool. Stratus Nimbus, Cumulus Nimbus, you know, it's a It'll be dark tonight, followed by scattered daylight throughout the morning. Uh, that's my forecast. But, you know, we have this meteorology thing. We use these kind of cool terms. And now we have the Internet of Things. We have the Internet of Everything. But, folks, all this is is embedded systems. Our armed forces were dealing with this 40 years ago. Missile defense systems, okay? Embedded systems mean that there's firmware, there's hardware, there's software. There's these things embedded in what we do. Now all we've done is push this into consumer products and public transportation. This is not something new. This is not some brand new thing that we need to prepare for or we're not prepared. We just need to be savvy about it and we need to understand that now we have risk exposure in here and we need to require people that aren't doing mill spec type of contracting, that are doing consumable products, that they need to think about this. So, to so smart cities, um, you know, I, 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 I talk about this having spent some, a lot of time in APAC and, and Asia Pacific, where really, you know, when you look at South Korea and Songdo, a completely designed uh, smart city from the ground up, uh, you know, and you see these capabilities, uh, this is all the rage now, right? You know, smart city, smart nation, really kind of tough in the United States because when you have to reverse engineer smart cities into cities with crumbling infrastructure and you can't greenfield that, extremely challenging. Uh, we'll find a way, but it's going to be, it'll, it'll be messy. But in, in countries where they're starting from scratch and you can build these things from inception, you can build transportation systems and things that make people's lives better, um, you know, easier when you have a, a clear canvas, a greenfield uh, operation. Um, but you still need to think about security because all the convenience that comes into that makes, makes all of these things uh, exploitable. So when you look around that whole, that, this whole city, uh, cycle here from energy, mobility, to buildings and homes, water, public services. Imagine all the embedded technology. So I'll say there's embedded systems throughout that, whether it's critical infrastructure, uh, industrial control systems, uh, networks that are tying together, parking meters, voting systems, public transportation, all these things are connected, right? Uh, because we all want to have real-time data, we want the convenience of things being connected, but with that comes vulnerability. It doesn't mean we stop. It means we're smart. We, it means that we use engineering. If you can't draw it, engineering when I was, you know, engineering, if, if we can't draw it, we can't build it, right? We should at least have some semblance of looking at how these things connect together, the layered defenses that we can have on those things, because people's lives, I believe, we haven't seen it yet, heaven forbid, but it's, but you can, it, it's, it's that accident that's, you know, you just see it coming. You know, we have an aged, uh, aged uh, 
critical infrastructure in the United States. Our electrical grid is 95% owned by private industry, just for an example. I don't know, many U.S. citizens don't even realize that. They think the U.S. government owns the, the, the grid, the power grid. No, they don't. 95% of it's owned by private industry. So how does the government encourage them to upgrade and invest? Uh, so there are lots of challenges, lots of challenges that we have. So the mantra, security must be built in up front, not bolted on after. You know, we've talked about this in, in software for years, right? Uh, the bolting on after is never, never uh, as, it's never going to be as, when we talk about project management, we say that requirements come in further down the life cycle. It's always more expensive and, and it's always less effective. So, you know, looking at security being built in from the very beginning. And so what I, what I tell folks, you know, in the United States, we have this five-star crash rating. And people, I, I would say, you can, might, some might disagree with me, parents, concerned adults, we buy vehicles. If our kids and people we care about are going to be in, if we actually consider this, is it a safe vehicle? Do we think that if there's an accident, heaven forbid, that they, they have a higher assurance of safety based on these crash tests? Should we not have some semblance of security in products that we buy that could have life, limb, and property implications? Of course we should. How we get there is, is through conversations of me at least seeing this with you today, talking to, to, to laboratories and, and raising awareness within our government of things we need to do. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that is part of my burning platform for you today. So the call to action. Colleges and, and universities must incorporate security into all engineering disciplines, right? I mean, we need at least a, a cybersecurity, security 101 in every engineering course on the planet. Engineers, I mean, just look across the products we make. Mechanical engineering's there, electrical engineering's there, software engineering's there, chemical engineering's there, and I'm probably missing some others. Chemical engineering's there and the plastics and the semiconductor and all these things that we're developing to, to put these products out. But those folks are designing these things in verticals. Stovepipe. How many times do we talk about killing the stovepipes, right? But, 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 uh, I don't, I, I'll be retired and maybe drinking Tangeray and tonics somewhere on a nice beach, hopefully, uh, and they'll still be talking about, we got to get rid of these stovepipes. We have stovepipes within our engineering disciplines, and as educators and people that influence educators, we have an international academic program where we work with universities around the world to co-create content for cybersecurity, uh, to partner with them, to raise awareness on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is no longer just software and networks. Cybersecurity is embedded in every engineering discipline we have on the planet. We need to recognize it. We need to do something about it. We need to do more than talking about it. It needs to be more than this accident we see coming that we, fee we feel powerless to do anything about. For those already in the workforce, so, you know, we have folks in the workforce, and, you know, some of those folks may not go back for further education. I, you know, we try to encourage people to be committed to lifelong learning and education. That's not always the case. And so we have lots and lots of folks that are already in the workforce. What do we do to, to raise awareness with those in the workforce that they need to understand? Maybe it's on-the-job training. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, corporations need to build out their own type of in-house training to raise awareness so these engineers understand that when they're starting to build and design these types of products, it can't be in a stovepipe, that at the inception, when they're doing a scope baseline of some product that you're going to develop, that the engineers come together and somebody raises a hand and says, so what are the cybersecurity implications? What are the data privacy implications? Are there any data sovereignty issues? Are there, you know, there's a whole range of things that, that come together in the products that we design. <clears throat> we also have supply chain, right? And, and we've been longtime advocates of saying, look, supply chain is a major, major vulnerability for us. You need to understand the components that are going into the products that we make. We need to understand, uh, you know, some semblance of, of security built into that, that there aren't back doors built into these components. Uh, I know that the U.S. government and, and DOD have certain constraints on, on supply chain issues to ensure to offer some assurances. Is that enough? I don't know. But in private industry, it really can be the wild, wild west. You're buying products with chips and, and semiconductor and things from you don't know where. 
and these things provide access uh, maybe to your home, maybe to your vehicle, maybe to your phone. Uh, and so, you know, we, we need to be conscious of the supply chain. So um, our research shows that between 2015 and 2020, we see a delta of about 1.5 million qualified cybersecurity professionals. Uh, it's a little off topic of, 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 um, of the engineering uh, integration. So that's just pure cyber. I would say that we have vulnerability because we have engineers out there that are higher, higher numbers in this that are developing products. And this is just looking at the landscape as we look at it today. We are creating vulnerabilities every single day in the products that are rolling off of the car lots, the assembly lines, coming out of manufacturing <clears throat> and operations and productions management. And uh, it's daunting. I mean, when you're a CEO of an organization that says, we want to inspire a safe and secure cyber world, you know, I feel like I have one of those little camping shovels, you know, and there's, there's the Rocky Mountains are over there, and they say, we need to move them about two miles east. And, you know, and I'm kind of just digging away at that, trying to go, I'm, I'm going to do yeoman's work at it. But, uh, but, and that's kind of the uphill battle that we're, we're faced. But we, can, we are consumers. We're involved in education. Um, we can raise awareness, and we can call to, to action folks um, to do something about these types of things. So we are ISC squared. Um, you know, we're, we're here to inspire a safe and secure cyber world. We do that in a number of ways through certifications. We have an array of certifications in healthcare, uh, cyber forensics, um, you know, secure software lifecycle. Our CISSP is probably our most popular certification. In fact, often I'm introduced as the CEO of the CISSP. No, we're the company behind the CISSP. Uh, and uh, so we've got a lot of uh, folks around the world that uh, carry that credential uh, with pride. And so I uh, unfortunately can't stay for the Q&A section, but they've afforded me the opportunity to entertain some questions. So it could be anything relative to this. It could be from GDPR. It can be from anything related to cybersecurity. Um, I'd be happy to try to field any questions if there's any interest. Yes, sir. Uh, 